Chapter 18. I stood at the water pump, scrubbing my body. It was bitterly cold outside, but I didn't care. I would scrub my body, I decided, each and every morning, no matter how cold it was and no matter how tired I was. I was alive, and I meant to stay that way. We had no soap, but at least I was able to wash away the caking dirt of Birkenau. I paid careful attention to where I had been tattooed. Too many others had let their tattoos get infected, and that had taken them to the camp surgeon. You didn't want to go to the camp surgeon. Ever. I even rubbed my teeth with my wet fingers. We had no toothbrushes or toothpaste, of course, but it felt important to remember what it was like to be human. As I scrubbed the taint of Birkenau from my body, I read the signs the Nazis had posted above the water pump. The block is your home. Main clean cleanliness. And one laughs, your death. Big jokers, the Nazis. You could play by all the rules, keep yourself clean, do everything right, and still the Nazis would kill you for looking at them wrong. But I played the game. Work at Birkenau was as bad as everywhere else. Here, as in Plazo, we were to build new barracks. The ground for the new section was so big, it would double the size of the camp when it was finished. The Nazis called the new camp B3, but we prisoners called it Mexico. I don't know where the name started. But Mexico always sounded exotic to me. Warm and sunny with beaches and laughing faces. Maybe that's why the prisoners nicknamed it Mexico. To make them think of it something very different from what B3 really was. The camp storehouse, where the Nazis kept all the valuables the Jews from towns and villages brought with them when they first arrived, we called Canada. Food was a weak coffee substitute in the morning, watery soup at lunch, and bread at night. The bread was hard and tasteless and had to serve as breakfast as well. The soup was tepid, and you were lucky if there was a limp potato floating in it. I learned a trick with the soup, which was to wait a while before lining up for it. The heavier parts of the soup sank to the bottom. If you were among the last in line, your soup was thicker. I almost always got some chunk in my soup by holding back until the end. Just that little extra bit of food might keep me from becoming a muscleman. We were forbidden to go out at night, so instead of camp latrines, we had to use a barrel in the barrack if we had to go to the bathroom. There were two barrels for 500 people, so we learned to go to the latrines during the day as much as we could. There was one latrine per prison block, really just a roll of holes cut in boards that sat over the cesspit. Prisoners stood guard at the door with clocks. Their job was to make sure that no prisoner spent more than two minutes in the latrine. If you took longer than that, an SS guard would go in and beat you with a club until you left. There would be no dawdling at Birkenau. The joke was on the Germans this time, though. By leaving the same prisoner stationed at the latrine, the one place we all had to go throughout the day, they gave us a secret postman. The Nazis never wanted us to talk to one another, but if you ever had a message for someone else, you could whisper it to the prisoner on watch at the latrine door as you went in. He would remember it and quietly whisper it to the recipient when he came to take care of his business later that day. One day as I went into the latrine with another prisoner, I heard the watchman whisper, tonight. I didn't know what the message meant, but it wasn't for me anyway. That night, I was fast asleep on my shell, slotted in with all the other prisoners in my barrack, when shouts startled me out of my sleep. Capos and SS guards were in the barracks, yelling at us to get up and smacking at the prisoners with their clubs. I blinked, disoriented and scared, but managed to tumble off of my shelf. This was something new for Birkenau, where they usually at least let us sleep through the night. We quickly assembled in the yard, standing in rows and I could tell immediately that something was wrong. The floodlights in the towers weren't sliding lazily over the grounds like usual. They were turned outside, where they swept the woods quickly back and forth. Guard dogs barked beyond the barbed wire fence surrounding the camp, and cars and tanks rolled by outside. A prison break, a man next to me whispered. A prison break? How? Who? My heart thumped in my chest. I wished I was with them whoever they were, running for the forest, the hills, anywhere but here. Get out, I prayed for them. Get away, fly. 
a Nazi came around checking our numbers against a clipboard. There were always prisoners who couldn't get out of bed again, who had become muscle menners. That's what the Nazis wanted anyway, to kill us with work and starvation. But which of the missing prisoners were dying back in the barracks, and which of them were running free in the woods? The Nazi grabbed my hand, read the number on my arm, and then moved on to the next prisoner. My wrist still hurt where he grabbed me. His grip was so tight. The Nazis were mad. Prisoners weren't supposed to stand up for themselves. Prisoners weren't supposed to escape. Will they make it out? Where will they go if they do? Could I escape from Birkenau too, I wondered. Could I live in the woods eating berries and nuts, sleeping out in the cold? It couldn't be worse than the camps. And maybe not every pole was like the awful boys throwing snowballs at the train station. Maybe some sympathetic pole would take me in, hide me in their barn. We stood for hours late into the night. They even went through the roll call again, as though some of us might have slipped off in between, which didn't seem possible. Then, almost at dawn, there were shouts of excitement from the Nazis beyond the fence. The gates were opened, and a bunch of ragged prisoners were marched back inside, all beaten and bloodied. I immediately felt sick to my stomach and swayed on my feet. The escaped prisoners hadn't made it. They'd been caught. How, I didn't know, and how many had run and how many they'd caught, I didn't know either. But these men hadn't made it, and the price would be severe. The SS officer of the watch sneered at us. There is no escape from Birkenau, he cried. No escape. Perhaps some of you are thinking about running. There was no one waiting to help you on the outside. There is nowhere for you to hide. You will be caught. And here is what we do to those who try to escape. They lined the men up against the wall at the assembly yard. Rat tat 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 tat. The watch officer gunned them down himself, riddling their bodies with bullets. Bring forward their work detail, the guard cried. Other men were pulled out of the ranks, prisoners who had done nothing but work alongside the men who'd run, prisoners who hadn't tried to escape. Rat tat 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 tat. The SS man shot them too. Then the soldier turned the gun on us in the roll call ranks. Rat tat 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 tat. Closed my eyes and prayed the bullets wouldn't find me. Trembling as prisoners were hit and fell dead to the ground all around me. I couldn't move though. I couldn't run. If I flinched, I would be singled out and shot. This is the punishment for escape. All of you will share the blame, the watch officer yelled. He shot until the machine gun ran out of bullets. Click, click, click. The SS officer threw his weapon to the ground. Clean up this mess, he ordered, and he marched away, leaving us to carry our own dead. That night, and what little sleeping time there was left, I dreamed that Amon Goth was chasing me with his dogs. I ran and ran and ran, but I could never quite get away. Then one of the dogs lived and bit my left arm. I woke up screaming, holding my burning left arm. My left arm where the Nazis had carved B3087 into my skin.